Mm-hmm. Well, g- growing up in the 60s, in the 50s and 60s, uh, first of all, I should say, I came from a family that was really oriented towards serving their country. My dad had come from Ireland. He was a Sinn Féin rebel in Ireland. And then he came to this country and he was in World War I. Uh, I'm the last of a big family, 13th of 13 kids. So, um, But my oldest brother was in right at the end of World War II. My, uh, another brother was in Korea. So there was this tradition, first of all, this understanding, not, not just tradition, it's not sort of understanding you served your country. And then in the early 60s, I was totally affected by John Kennedy, as a lot of people my age were. Um, and, you know, obviously his inaugural... Uh, ask not, quote, uh, rang in, in a lot of people's ears at that time. And so it was just always sort of assumed that if war happened, I was going to, I would go. And I think, I don't want to th- think we were naive, but we weren't quite as uh, as uh, jaded in those days about the government and about uh, you know, serving. And, um, so when Vietnam started, and this is during the Cold War, and part of anti-communism, you know, the whole com- uh, communism is an evil system type thing. And I, I uh, when I turned, well, when I graduated from high school, turned 18, I uh, realized I was going to, I wanted to serve. And um, to get it out of the way, and also because the war was happening at that time, I went ahead, I enlisted when I was about 18 plus years old. I think, first of all, anybody goes to war and you experience, especially at the age of 19, you experience uh, the destruction, you experience the death, you experience, you know, I had one of my two closest friends was killed about a month after we got in country. You experience that and it, it, it has a, a, a really a life-changing effect on you. It, it, and so, you know, all the negatives, all the trauma that one associates with that. Uh, I think what affected me more probably, because I, you know, being a person who paid attention in history class, I knew that war was about killing and about destruction, so I wasn't necessarily surprised. I don't mean it was okay. I, did, I don't know if you ever get used to it. I think you kind of get numb to it. But um, I think what affected me more about the war was was the... the uh, Sort of the, the the unending nature of it that, that every day was about I'm alive today. Every day was you know you had to readjust your psyche to 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 think that uh, you know this this is about survival. This is about uh, not just winning. I mean we didn't. I don't know if we ever thought it really as much about winning as we thought about surviving. And so there was a lot of a lot of that survival uh, trauma that, that that came with that. I think the other thing that affected me in Vietnam more than, maybe more than seeing soldiers die, uh, first of all, the, the, you know, war is, is, there's something exciting and dramatic, and I don't mean that in a good way, in a happy way, but it's, war is really exciting. It, all your pistons are firing in war, all your, you know, the adrenaline is flowing. And, you know, to see the different ways, as, as, as horrible as it sounds, but to see the different ways that humankind has found to kill one another. Uh, the, the, you, you see the mines, you see the booby traps, you see the, 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 you know, the, the, the jets coming in, uh, we'd call in air support, air strikes. Um, the Huey, well, you know, the power of the Huey helicopter was just, uh, it was a symbol of, of, of America, really, at, at that time. Uh, so I think there, the intensity and the totality of, of, of war was really um, uh, something that at the age of 19, I was, uh, I think it, it had a major impact on me. Uh, one of those things that once you've been there, once you've done that, once you've seen that, your mind can never go back to a time before that. Uh, the other thing that personally that, that bothered me, I think, more than, than just soldiers dying was the the kids and the old people, the, the Vietnamese people, the, the poverty that was there, and the destruction. And you'd, you'd look at, at kids, and there'd be, you know, one, one of the kids who had a, an ear missing, another one had a nose missing, one of them had a, a bundle wrapped around his, where his foot should have been. You see the, the kids, and you know, I, was, I was, wasn't married was, uh, at the time, but I was, uh, I thought of nieces and nephews, you know, I'd see in their faces these uh, family members. So I think, I think seeing the destruction and being raised on a farm, 
you know, you go, you go out in, up in the highlands, it'll, it's rural, a lot of rural area. Uh, and uh, you see the farmers, and they, they're sort of the domestic water buffalo, you know. And we would often, as, as, a, as a unit, when we'd go through an area, sometimes we'd, we'd send water buffalo ahead of us in case there were mines there. So they'd set off the mines. And, it, and you know, the, farmer, the farm boy in me was thinking, well, you know, wait a second, what, what would I think if, if this was happening back home and they sent our, our milk cows through the, through the minefield? So, I mean, but just seeing the, 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 the disruption of, of their whole social fabric was, I think, had more of an impact. But especially looking in the eyes of the kids, there was a little, a little girl, there were two little girls, we were out on a mission, and two little girls who were were going through the dump, uh, the garbage dump, trying to find food, and just you know, cute little ten-year-old girl, and, and uh, you know, I fell in love. I gave my heart to her, and, you know, and, and and it was really sad leaving her. You know, just thinking about the kids, and and you. So years later, when the um, UNICEF did a report on on the number of casualties after the war that had been. Uh, people who've been killed or hurt by mines that were left from Vietnam by the Americans. Um, they said there were, you know, somewhere in the vicinity of, well, 50,000 young people who had been uh, injured or killed by mines. Half of them had died. Um, and I thought about, you know, how I had planted a lot of mines in Vietnam. And, and so, and that came back, thinking about the kids. You know, it's, it's one thing to kill an enemy soldier. I mean, it's, it's something that you learn in the service, but you just, it's sort of, I mean, it, if you're going to war, and soldiers kill soldiers. That's the sad truth of war. But to see the kids, and to think of that years later, you know, kids who, who were probably, you know, grandkids of the kids that we were, or the people that we were fighting were getting killed by the mines that we planted. I think so. So that was, I th that was what impacted me. The other part, I guess, is just the camaraderie between uh, soldiers, the camaraderie. And surprisingly, not just between American soldiers, but, I, but since the war, I've had friends who've gone back to Vietnam who talk about staying at the homes of Viet Cong, former Viet Cong, former North Vietnamese soldiers. And there's sort of a soldier's camaraderie that's, that, that is there, in, but especially among Americans. You know, you, you become closer to your buddies than than you do to anybody except maybe your your intimate family, uh, and uh, you know that 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 closeness. But at the same time, you, you're developing that closeness. You develop a certain fence around you because you, you, people die, and you don't want to get too close. And so it's, there's kind of a dichotomy there. Uh, but but that 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 sense of if I can say it this way that you you you're part of humankind's most insane, violent effort, war. And at the same time, in all of this ugliness, there is what probably equates to agape love, you know, the, that you share with one another. You know, in Vietnam, we, we did tours of duty rather than the duration or point system. There was, there was a point system, but very few people use that. Mostly you were there for your 12 or 13 months. Supposedly that was done to, to help us psychologically. You know, we'd know for certain we were coming home at a certain time. Well, the problem was that made a, that that became a, nothing more than a target for survival. If I can live until I get to that date, and then when you when you did leave, you left your friends because they we didn't all rotate in at the same time. So you're leaving your friends. I remember that first two weeks when I came home after Vietnam, I didn't want to go anywhere or do anything. I just sit. And I was I was thinking about it. I, mentally, I was still back in the. Uh, remember Charlie Daniels' song about back in uh, still in Saigon, that kind of that sort of a, an attitude. I think, you know, early on uh, when I first came back, there, there, you know, I can real quick stories here, but uh, when I first came back, there were there were little things that you notice right away. Uh, again, immediately upon coming home, I didn't want to see anybody. I didn't want you know all the things that you do in, a, in, in when you come back to civilian life. You're supposed to you're supposed to want to go. Uh, see all the girls and go to the games and do all that sort of thing. I didn't, you know, I just wanted to, to be at home. There, there was that reclusiveness that, that, I, that I, I was really uncomfortable with. I, I thought, good God, what's the matter with me? Uh, you know, because in Vietnam, you dream of the day you come back and the, you dream of these, these, the girls, you dream of the things you're going to do. Uh, there was that, there was little things like, I remember when I, 
uh, after my leave, when I went back on Army duty after Vietnam, being in a replacement company in, in Fort Carson, Colorado, and every night I'd, I'd wake up at about 3 o'clock in the morning, and I'd say, what the hell's happening? You know, there'd be no noise that would wake me up. I, I couldn't figure out what was happening. And finally, after being a real bright person, after a few weeks of that happening, I realized that what was waking me up is that not that there was noise waking me up, but there was nothing waking me up. There was no noise. And in Vietnam, we, we were about a half a mile away from a place they called Artillery Hill, where all night long the guns were firing. And when those guns stopped firing, that meant that the Viet Cong, that Charlie, as we call them, was closer to us. So they, because an artillery round, as you know, has to go out before it, before it arms itself. So that meant they were too close for artillery. And, and I would wake up with the silence, out of, you know, Simon and Garfunkel, the sounds of silence, uh, that, that would, wake, would wake me up. And little things like that, you know, I've told, you know, disturbed sleep, I mean, that's been something that's continued. I've told people I haven't had a full night's sleep since 1967. Um, but but the constant waking up, little by there there was of of course the first sight of civilian America when I came back on from Vietnam, McCord Air Force Base when we were getting ready going over to Fort Lewis to get our dress green so we could go home, and the first sight was a protest demonstration. I remember there was a a, a girl a, a blonde long hair blonde member that back in those days the Peter Paul and Mary long blonde hair look. Uh, but this, she was carrying a sign and it said baby killer. That was one of those epithets that was used. And, and you know, that, that, was, that was bothersome. At first I thought, you know, that's a rare happening. But little by little, even in, you know, in, in Colorado Springs, wherever, even in Missoula, you come, uh, even if there wasn't outright hostility, there was clearly, uh, we, we were not well loved uh, as a veteran. We were, t we were 20 years old. And we were expected to act like we were 45, and we were expected to follow the, I think, the World War II uh, uh, model. And, uh, and and the older veterans were uh, not particularly helpful. I mean, to them, we were losers. We were whiners. We complained too much. So there was that feeling of being in no man's land, uh, the man without a country. And Philip Nolan wasn't it the man without the without a country. You know, it, it, there was a sense of, of betrayal, a sense of damage. You know, do you know what pe we did? We just offered for, for, for you people, for the, for the country. Well, more than any sort of patriotic uh, anger or betrayal, it was sort of a, of a, of a personal, uh, uh, again, it, it, you know, that I think there's a term called anime that means basically you just have, you have you're, you're without a name, without any identity. It, 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 it kind of... I think did that to us. It, it made us, it, uh, our, our sense of having, you know, we had gone to war, we had fought this war, which we had been told all our lives, you know, you go, you serve your country, you'll be honored, you'll be respected, it's the right thing to do. And we had done that and we'd gotten shot at and we'd seen all this happen and then, and it didn't mean anything, it didn't seem like it didn't mean anything to the people and to the, and it wasn't just, you know, right wing or left wing, it was kind of across the board. And what it, it, in some people, it made them bitter. Other people, it made them uh, turn against very much against the war. Uh, I think in my case, what it did was just make me uh, feel real isolated. I felt, you know, that, okay, I guess it is really me against the world here. Um, and so I think that was that was what that that uh, sort of uh, it was a disrespect. But it, I think that's what it did. And there were other little. There were some some more palpable, some more material things that happened as well. For example, getting a job. If you, if you filled out a job application, you, you learned real quickly not to say you were a Vietnam veteran because it was going to work against you. There were government programs that were supposedly intended to help returning veterans. The CETA, Comprehensive Employment Training Act, program had as its primary group to be, its target group, it was, the, it was Vietnam veterans. And yet, the CETA jobs that happened, for example, here in Missoula, and at the time, you know, I'm what, in my mid-twenties and a uh, healthy person looking for work, I uh, applied for CETA jobs and, and never even got a, an interview. I mean, and I don't know very many Vietnam veterans who ever benefited from those programs, even job service programs. It was a, it was a joke. So, so there's some real, uh, even at the university, I, when I enrolled in the, at the university in, in 75, when I first came back, talking about how it affected me, when I first came back, I wanted to go to school but the, the, the whole hippie thing 
at school made me feel not welcome there, not want to be part of that scene. Uh, again, that sort of man without a country type feeling. Um, but when I did enroll in school in 74, um, the, uh, the financial aid people at the university w would not approve any kind of grants or school loans if you were on the GI Bill, even though it, you know, it's supposed to be financial need based, but they just had this ruling. We had a vets club at the UM and we actually got it. It was, un it was un they were wrong, they were illegal. They could, you can't do that. But they had, they were doing that, and for a lot of years, veterans you couldn't get, you couldn't apply for the, the Pell grants or the st Stafford loan, any of that. They just wouldn't wouldn't let you sign up if you were on a federal program. So th there were some real practical things that that, uh, that greeted us, and little by little that started. Where at first at first you get mad about it, and then you start withdrawing and thinking it has to be you, and then uh, you know it's, it's kind of like. It's kind of like when you when you get a, a cut, and if you can have it treated, you may have a scar, a little bit of a scar, and you may have a little bit of an infection for a while, but you can treat it. This sort these this sort of feeling, this this disrespect that we were getting, was sort of like having a scar, and instead of instead of being able to treat it, you just put bandaid upon bandaid on top of it, and pretty soon that scar is no longer the issue because you've got blood poison which has affected your kidney instead. And that's sort of what this, this, this kind of, uh, uh, for lack of a better term, the neglect I've started doing. And by, you know, by the time I'm 27 years old, I'm, I'm thinking bad thoughts of wa wanting out and, and uh, just, uh, you know, the, the, not just suicide and, and those sorts of issues, but you start thinking in terms of what they refer to as a foreshortened future. You, you know, you visualize, you know, I'm, this, is, this is where I'm at, this is, this is it. You know, back in those days it was called post-Vietnam syndrome and then it was called delayed stress. I still prefer the term delayed stress because PTSD I think is overused and not all PTSD is created equal. I think it applies differently to different people. But um, I, I, I think at my probably my lowest point, which is about 1975, PTSD was not accepted as a as a legitimate issue. Neither was Agent Orange. They wouldn't admit it to Agent Orange exposure, which I was also ex exposed. And uh, I had a couple of things that happened at, 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 at my lowest point. I happened to be enrolled at the university, and I went to uh, to see a, a, a psychiatrist, uh, Doctor Cotts. Uh, Dr. Cotts, uh, and this, you know, this is back in the days when you, men, you know, especially if you're a GI, you don't go see a psychiatrist. You know, I said, I'd have to be crazy to go to a psychiatrist. Um, but I went and saw, saw Dr. Cotts they, when I went into the, for, you know, stress manifests itself in medical physiological terms. And so, and then you go to the doctor and they'll send you on to the, to the, to the psychologist. Sometimes that's overdone, but in this case, it was really good that that happened because Dr. Cotts happened to have been a, a POW in World War II. And he, you know, instant, there was an instant connection. And you know, this, uh, you know, pretty much servicemen, service people can automatically tell one another in a crowd. I mean, it's almost, there's almost a bond, uh, an ethereal sort of bond that forms. But Dr. Cotts understood, and, and he was probably as much as anything was, was uh, life-saving to me. Uh, certainly helped turn me around. At the time, my wife was very supportive. I had a couple other teachers, a couple of friends. Uh, uh, my mother was, uh, uh, alive at the time, and, and, and you know, so there were some close people. There were a lot of, there were, but even within families, there, there, within my family, there were people who were totally anti-war, and in those days, being anti-war was almost synonymous with being anti-veteran. I mean, it, it, they, 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 they weren't exclusive terms. But I think one of the things that Dr. Cotts and, and uh, the Professor Dr. Lauren, one of the things that different people started talking about was about the problems in, uh, historically that have impacted veterans. Uh, if you read All Quiet on the Western Front, you know that that story. Uh, you, uh, and it dawned on me that if I'm hurting this bad, there must be a lot of other people feeling the same way. Because 
as a veteran, you start you start internalizing all these the problems and the survival guilt and all that sort of thing. You internalize and you think it must be me. And when Dr. Koch and, and the other, when I was able to realize that that it, it, yes, it was how I was how I was responding to it, but but this is a problem. This is an issue that's legitimate. Um, I, I thought how many other people must other veterans must be thinking the same thing, and I started doing a lot of uh, veterans advocacy. I wrote some papers on on the veterans at the time for a couple of teachers who were really receptive and responsive. Uh, and I, you know, I don't want to I don't want to sound uh, flaky here, but but it was almost as if I was supposed to do that. It was almost as if that was, uh, and that that became in itself curative to me. That became, uh, and I think I. Even I think to this day, I, I think I probably gain as much or more for myself with it, whatever advocacy work I do for veterans as the people that I might be helping. And uh, I think that was probably in the late 70s was when the turnaround came, when I started really getting involved in, in, in working for veterans and, and uh, to the quote, to the cause, you know. Uh, and, and and you know that may I mean maybe I am flaky maybe that is flaky but it just it just it 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 worked for me and uh, um, I think you know I've been diagnosed with PTSD but I think all people who have PTSD are kind of like alcoholics you're never a recovered alcoholic you're a recovering well, I refer to people with uh, PTSD as recovering stressors I don't think you ever get over it I'm just convinced you never get totally over it. But you're always in a recovering phase, and you maintain a level of recovery. And uh, that people do it in different ways, and mine has been a lot with the advocacy work. But you know, the old saying. I remember there was a. I think there was a book even written at the time that I ain't well yet, but I sure am better. And I think that's sort of where I started going in the late seventies. Loss of, of faith. I mean, that that changed our, our country a lot. And and then we went into the Watergate era. And uh, you know the American people lost faith in its government. And it, I think there there were a lot of things that happened in the in the years after Vietnam and even even to the present. I think you see that reflected in in the the bipolarization in politically uh, even in this last election. It's not uh, it's not a division just about issues. It's a you know it's so easy to to get back into that yelling at one another. And uh, you know, so I, th I think Vietnam caused or was the the, the beginning of a lot of that. So I, it, it did. It totally changed our country. It changed our social um, uh, ways of living. It changed some of our mores. And again, some for the good. Uh, it, it did. It did uh, open up uh, uh, discussion that should have been there. Are things that should have been discussed and changed years earlier that we we just sat on during because of the complacency, if you want to call it that, of the 50s. And, and I think that was good, but but then again, it was as I said, it was revolutionary rather than evolutionary, and in the process, a lot of damage was done, a lot of damage to, uh, you know, a, a democracy. In order for a democracy, a country like ours, to 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 work effectively, the people have to believe in 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 in, in the basis of, of of what the country is about. I think during the Vietnam years, we stopped believing, and then the Watergate years, we we stopped believing that that. Uh, uh, that that um, uh, we were, you know, we, the, in what we could do, and uh, uh, the the uh, idealism, if you want to call it that, of, of the Kennedy years, w went. Uh, I think someone used the term. We stood knee deep in garbage while reaching for the moon, and that's what we were sort of doing during those years. You know, we 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 were we were sending Armstrong to the moon at the same time we were ripping the apart here on uh, in America. So I think it changed, and and as far as the veterans, you know, you know, fifty-eight thousand Vietnam soldier American soldiers died in Vietnam, according to the National Association of Suicidology Statistics. More than seventy thousand Vietnam veterans have committed suicide. Vietnam veterans today are still fighting the VA. I'm one of them, fighting the VA over Agent Orange issues, um, and the VA, which is everybody's favorite punching bag, and deservedly so usually. Um, is you know is still fighting us. I mean, I'm you know late 60s and it's still fighting on issues of Agent Orange. I mean the fact, you know, 40, 50 years ago I was sprayed with Agent Orange. It caused certain issues that the VA itself accepts uh, ischemic heart uh, uh, stomach issues. And the VA is still fighting 
about whether or not to treat or to, to, to compensate. And so I, I think, you know, I think for the Vietnam veterans, they never quite got back in step. The good part is I think there's, there's, there's a, a, you know, this may sound like a backhanded compliment, but there's a certain amount of, uh, if we can't serve as anything else, we can at least serve as bad examples, uh, an example of what not to do, what not to be. And I think one of the reasons, and, and then maybe it gets carried too far nowadays, but one of the reasons that the veterans of today are, are being given more of a welcome, more acknowledgement when they come home, is because of what the Vietnam veterans went through and because of the agitation. You know, the government didn't come out and say, hey, Vietnam veterans were screwed over, we need to do something. It was Vietnam veterans themselves who did it. It was Vietnam veterans like Jan Scruggs was building the, the wall in Washington, D.C. It was Vietnam veterans who, who finally said, you know, we served after the Iran hostage situation, said, hey, we're waiting for our welcome home too. But I think, no, Vietnam veterans will, are affected by it. Vietnam veterans, their lives, uh, and that, this isn't across the board. There are a lot of Vietnam veterans who feel totally opposite about things that I, the, from what I feel. Uh, but I think generally Vietnam veterans um, have not been what they otherwise might have been because of the problems. And, and I think there's, a, there's a, a certain amount of lost opportunity, uh, a certain amount of uh, you know, lives. That There are a lot of Vietnam veterans who, who had it not been for Vietnam, uh, would be doing something different, would have accomplished more. And by the way, I don't think it's the war itself. I, this, I'm slightly different here than a lot of people. I don't think it was the war itself. It's not the, the, it's not the death in combat, because that's something that, while well, you don't get used to it or think it's okay, it's something that happens every generation. It was the reception. It, our PTSD came to Vietnam veterans not so much because of what we saw in the war, but because of the reception and what we didn't have when we came back home. I really believe that. I really believe that PTSD is a veteran's problem, not a soldier's problem. Uh, and uh, I think so. for a lot of Vietnam veterans, that, that's going to last, and that has lasted, and that has, has impacted their families. The other thing is family, family issues. You know, Vietnam veterans had, in the younger years especially, they had a, a, uh, an incarceration rate double of their non-veteran contemporaries, divorce rate double. Uh, unemployment rate double. Uh, and those things, even if they're cured down the road, the the residual effects still still last. And uh, um, I think so. Yeah, but I think kind of like with the Civil War, the veterans of the Civil War, particularly Confederate veterans, peopled the West. And a lot of the story you see of, of the old West are stories of Civil War veterans acting out their delayed stress, you know, the, the gunfighters and all that. Well, the, there, there's a lot of, of PTSD in the history of the West. And I think you see a lot of the, of, of, uh, uh, the things that have happened since Vietnam is the same is, is in a lot of cases is, is uh, veterans who are, who are uh, you know, trying to readjust their lives. The one that, that is, is most clear is we got to get out of this place, yeah. a Eric Burden and the animals. Bobby Bear's song, Detroit City, where there's a phrase, I want to go home, that one is, uh, that we, we sang that one over there a lot. Uh, it's actually Detroit City, Bear, Bobby Bear, B-A-R-E, Bobby Bear, country singer. Uh, but, but definitely, we got to get out of this place. There's another song that I first heard, it's going to sound really strange, two other songs actually. One is The Monkeys, I'm a Believer. Because, you know, the Monkees were this kind of silly group, but yet they had some really good music, and music written by, I'm a believer, I think it was written by Neil Diamond. Uh, so, um, that song, I remember hearing that in Vietnam and, and thinking, damn it, and then, and then being told who they were, it was, it was weird. And the other song was, there was a song by Scott McKenzie, and I was not a, 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 a hippie type person, but uh, if you're going to San Francisco, be sure to wear some flowers in your hair. That was another song I remember that, that will take me right back. And there are a lot of songs. As a matter of fact, the music, when I do a ceremony, I'll often use a lot of credence, uh, you know, Fogarty music and that sort of thing, because it takes uh, Diana Ross and the, the Supremes. Uh, the, I think the Four Tops were, were my consistently favorite uh, soul group back then. Uh, but you listen to all, all the different music. And, um, but I'd have to say, the animals, we've got to get out of this place.